afternoon, and welcome to episode number three of Slash Tracks Action News Express. I'm Alex Vanover. Josh LaRue, the 80 slasher librarian, is currently out on assignment in the wilderness of Alaska. He's doing some research and documenting and uh, kind of observing the effects of warrior fuel uh, on a pack of wild, very agitated, and extremely hungry nuclear grizzly bears. I'll definitely get back to you, Slashaholics, in the next episode and let you know how that all works out, how his uh, documentation turned out, how everything uh, worked out for Josh. We love Josh. We hope uh, everything's going well, and uh, he should give those grizzlies, uh, you know, some breathing room. And, uh, you know, who knows what's going to happen because uh, <laughs> nuclear grizzlies on Warrior Fuel sounds dangerous AF. Um, so yeah, this is, uh, Slash Tracks Action News Express number three. So we're going to kind of cover all the very important and serious news stories of the week and the day, uh, in less than an hour. So got some big news today for the channel. Uh, Josh and I are actually starting a second channel and it's going to be called, um, the Slash Tracks Network with Alex Vanover. So go ahead and subscribe over there. Make sure you are subscribed. And uh, make sure you hit notifications and everything because you don't want to miss out on all the new content that we're going to be putting out. It's going to become a lot more regular and on a lot more consistent basis. Uh, we're going to have all the Slash Tracks Express news episodes will be over there uh, in the coming weeks. So there'll be new, uh, new episodes. We're going to have movie reviews that aren't horror, horror content related. We're going to have wrestling pay-per-view reviews, uh, old wrestling Raw episodes, Nitro episodes, reviews, maybe even new uh, wrestling reviews are going to be put it on that channel. We're going to have celebrity interviews. I actually have a celebrity interview lined up uh, with a former Nickelodeon star from our childhood. So all I have to do is uh, pull the trigger on that one, and we can get that out. But the first, before we start, you know, putting a lot of a lot of stuff like the interviews and stuff on the new channel, we want to make sure everybody subscribes. So the Slash Tracks Network with Alex Vanover. So that's the secondary channel to the Slash Tracks Network with Eighty Slasher Librarian. All right, let's get some more channel business real quick. Uh, if you guys want to help support the channel uh, and help it keep uh, gr you know growing and going for years to come, just like Josh always says, uh, you can get a cameo. We're at www.cameo.com slash slash tracks network. You can have me, you can have Josh, you can have Sean, you can have Mother Evil, you can have Master Evil, you can have anybody uh, give, you know, leave a cameo for you. Happy birthday, advice. Uh, you can even have an like an ask flashy. You can ask us who would win. We'll personalize it, and I prom I promise you it'll be a lot of fun. The last time I checked on Cameo, how much it actually cost for us to do it, it was like five bucks, and I think it was twenty percent off of that. So I think it was like four dollars. So you're not going to be spending a lot of money to help support the channel, and it's fun. Um, you can also support us on Patreon, uh, www.patreon.com/80/librarian. Uh, big shout out and thank you to all the patrons of the channel. Uh, we really appreciate it and we wouldn't be able to put out as much content as we do without you guys. So you are so valued and so appreciated. So thank you so much to all you guys and uh, girls. And I think the last little part of business is the email slash tracks 2020 at gmail.com. If you want to write in, uh, you have a suggestion for who would win. Uh, Dear Slashy, would you rather... If you want to just talk to me and Josh and uh, just about life, you want to ask us our opinion on something, you just want to kind of pick our brains, you like the channel, you want to tell us you do, you hate the channel, you want to tell us you do, go ahead and write us at slash tracks 2020 at gmail.com and we'll get back to you. Uh, we read every comment. We try to respond to every comment. We read every email. We try to reply to every email. And that's just something I, uh, I think is very important because your guys' time is just as valuable as ours. So... All the business is done, uh, except for well, I want to reiterate one more time. The Slash Tracks Network with Alex Vanover. Brand new channel. It's super exciting. We're going to have a bunch of brand new content, brand new shows, brand new everything. Make sure you subscribe to that. It's very important. You don't want to miss out on anything. Uh, let's get into uh, the actual episode. What, what do you guys say? It's been a while since we've done a news episode. Let's do it, baby. All right. Nice comment. Now, this is from our friend Mac888Spectral7, and he left this comment on Jason X, uh, our Slash Tracks reviews episode. He says, I've never one nice comment on Slash Tracks news. 
but listening to your content is like the feeling I get when I bite into a York peppermint patty. Uh, that's a phenomenal, phenomenal uh, comment. Love it. Love it. Uh, super funny. Uh, immediately evokes that 80s commercial in my mind. Um, it's like that commercial was like so like impressionable on me. It was like a core memory as a kid that I almost believed that like biting into a York peppermint patty was almost just as good as brushing your teeth. It's like, oh, no, dude, I'm good. I didn't brush my teeth. I had a pe peppermint patty. I'm good, mom. Everything's good. Let's go to bed. Pick out a story. It's time for me to go night night. Uh, yeah, Mac, thanks for leaving the comment. Thanks for watching the show. Thanks for commenting on everything. You're, you're a real one, dude. We really appreciate you and everything that you bring to the channel. And it's always fun when you comment. Uh, no mean comment for, for Express episodes. So we're just we're going to gloss over that. All positive right now. Uh, let's get into some fun facts. All right. <laughs> Approximately 70% 70, 70 of people in the world do not use toilet paper. Okay, 70% of people in the world do not use toilet paper. I'm surprised the number isn't actually higher than that with all the freaking toilet paper hoarding that was going on during COVID. Um, I'm surprised it's not like 80%. And I also know in Europe they use bidets and stuff. And I think people that are rich in America or other countries use bidets, um, which actually makes sense because water, you know, <laughs> shooting it off your booty makes more sense than just smearing it uh, onto your cheeks, uh, I guess, or w wiping it off your cheek. I don't know. Uh, it seems like kind of counterproductive if you actually want it off. So super soak that. <laughs> super soak that. Oh, in the words of Soldier Boy, get up a day. Um, the, the toilet paper hoarding got so bad back during COVID that I'm surprised that a status symbol wasn't um, rappers instead of having like gold and diamonds and stuff around their neck on a chain they didn't just have like double thick rolls of toilet paper or charmin on their chain so i was like oh shit man <laughs> oh wow he's doing really well look at that chain he's got on it's not platinum it's fucking just two ply charmin he is doing really and it's the soft type that the ba the baby bear in the charmin commercials uses to wipe his delicate baby butt uh yeah it's a big deal uh he's a super rich guy um Second fun fact and last fun fact of the episode. Now, this one's ridiculous. Anataya diphahydra, uh, and I just butchered the shit out of that. It's a phobia that, a, <laughs> it's the fear that somewhere, somehow, a duck is watching you. So we're just making up phobias now. Um, we're just coming, I don't even know where that would originate. I don't know where that would even start. Uh, that's, this is wild. Somebody out there is afraid that a duck is constantly watching them. Uh, they better not go to any ponds. They better not go to a bakery. They better not have bread in their hands at any point in their life or bird seed because that duck that's watching them is going to pick their moment to attack their ass. Um, I always feel like a duck is watching me <laughs> and I got no privacy or bird seed. All right, that one, that one, I don't know, it's ridiculous. Sports, we're going to get into sports. And we're kind of going through these fast and furious because this is the express, baby. We're trying to get you started on your Saturday morning. We want to get you out of bed, make some coffee, start out the day with the Slash Tracks Network, and then be about your business. All right, sports. In the Mariners' 44 years of existence, they've experienced more ruptured testicles, five of them, than playoff appearances four of them so the mariners have had more players rupture testicles in their franchise's existence than they've had trips to the mlb playoffs do the mariners hang a banner uh in their stadium for every ruptured testicle it's just got a guy like doubled over in pain just dying uh holding his testicles and it has like five times uh, right there. And maybe like it's right next to King Griffey Jr.'s um, retired number and Jackie Robertson's retired number and Edgar and Ichiro's retired numbers. Five. Who played? Who's number five for the Mariners that retired? That retired, Dad. Oh, nobody. That's just how many times the Mariners players have ruptured their ball sack uh, on these beloved uh, hollowed grounds of uh, Safeco Field. And I don't even think it's called Safeco Field anymore. Um do they? I don't know. That's just wild to me. How the hell do you even rupture your testicle in a baseball game? It's got to be some sort of like st groin strain or dive or like 
uh, so the Mariners, this isn't even on the rundown. The Mariners had just recently made news because they were randomly dropping hot dogs in parachutes onto people in the stadium. So I wonder if anybody ruptured a testicle trying to uh, get a free hot dog during that pr- promotional night. Yeah, definitely have to look into that. We're going to have to have one of the Slash Tracks interns look into that. Um, before I want before I get into the second sports story, I want to give a shout out to today's sponsor. So we are sponsored today. Uh, the Corey Hotline has actually sponsored the show today. So let's take a look uh, for a moment and see what's all about uh, what the Corey Hotline is all about. So Corey Feldman, Corey Haim, they have a brand new hotline. You can give them a call. Let's check it out. Guess what? Corey Haim and Corey Feldman are giving out their personal numbers. If you call 1-900-909-3700, you can listen to their private phone messages and get their personal number where you can leave them a message of your own. $2 the first minute, 45 cents each additional minute. Ask your parents before you call. 1-900-909-3700. If you call me right now, I'll give you my private number. Um, you call that number and you'll hear a recording and I'll give you my personal number if you call that. Um, and we'll wrap. Absolutely wild. Um, make sure that you get your your parents' permission before you call uh, 1-900-Corys, a uh, little slash holics out there. It almost looks like Corey Hayne didn't even know that he had a hotline. He looked uh, like he was just as confused as all the viewers are at home right now uh, finding out about the Corey hotline right here. But proud sponsor of today's Express episode. Make sure you give it a call and uh, always call responsibly. Don't go over your budget. I know that there, I know Corey Feldman is just... Uh, he is extremely personable and charismatic and all those things, but you don't want to spend all your money talking to Corey about Lost Boys 2 and Lost Boys 3. Don't do it. And if he starts to get into his music career, you might want to hang up. All right. That's today's sponsor. Second sports story of the episode. Ricky Henderson, Hall of Fame outfielder, Ricky Henderson, probably the greatest leadoff hitter in the history of baseball. Uh, one time, Ricky Henderson once went 0 for 0. And in that same game, he went 0 for 0. He had five stolen bases, and he scored four runs. He didn't even technically have an at-bat. And he had, he had five stolen bases and four runs scored. So he had to have got on base five times, at least, minimum. So all walks, I'm guessing, or bean balls. But you probably didn't get bean five times. You probably got walked five times. Uh that is an incredible stat. Um, he had no actual at bats documented, but still scored four runs and stole five bases. He's the all time um, stolen base record holder for Major League Baseball. It's probably never going to be broke. Uh, and he's also the all time, I think he's the all time runs leader. He scored more runs than anybody else in the Major League history. He also has 3,000 hits, and I think he might have more leadoff. Uh, home runs than anybody else in their career. Uh, Ricky Henderson's just like, he's like a two-time World Series champion as well. He won with the Blue Jays and the A's. He's what, like probably one of the greatest players that's ever lived. He refers to himself in the third person. Uh, <laughs> someone once quoted John 3.16 to Ricky Henderson, the Bible quote. And he said, he said, I don't know about anything about John 3.16, but Ricky's hitting 3.16. So... I don't know. Ricky Henderson was just, that's a wild stat though. No at bats, five stolen bases, four runs scored. Um, that's a perfect segue. Let's get, let's get into Slash Tracks Express Wrestling. All right, Slashaholics. On May 19th, 1996, over 28 years ago, the Click put on the infamous curtain call at Madison Square Garden. So this was during a house show. And this was right when Scott Hall and Kevin Nash were leaving the WWF at the time to go to WCW. And they broke, they broke kayfabe, they broke character, and him and Triple H and Scott Hall and Kevin Nash and the whole clique all decided, two were baby faces, two were heels. They all decide to hug and kiss and hold hands and sing Kumbaya in the middle of Madison Square Garden. This is like pre-internet too, like pre-internet as we know it. And there was like no camera phones or anything, but somebody captured this on camera they must have snuck a camera in um so the footage kind of leaked and 
WWF couldn't punish Diesel or or Scott Hall because they were leaving the company. So what are they going to do? So they can't punish them. Can't punish Shawn Michaels because he's your number one star. He's the champ. Uh, so they don't punish him. They, they punish Triple H. Uh, and he Triple H was supposed to win King of the Ring later that year, and he got punished, and Steve Austin ended up winning King of the Ring. And Steve Austin had that freaking Austin 316 promo after he beat Jake Roberts at King of the Ring. Austin 316 said, I just whipped your ass. Um, so had the curtain call not happened, there's no Austin 316 probably, at least not that promo because he's not winning it at that time. Uh, no NWO because Kevin Nash and Scott Hall would probably still be there uh, had they had signed new contracts. So the curtain call probably would never happened. And uh, God, no DX because WWF creative took the opportunity since fans knew triple H and Shawn Michaels were buddies. They decided to team them up and form DX. So it's like that moment almost single-handedly created the attitude era, which propelled wrestling business into the stratosphere at that time. So they broke kayfabe, totally screwed up in the ring and did something they weren't supposed to do. And it changed the wrestling business for the better. So it's like, it's just crazy. It's crazy how stuff like that works out. It's like, sometimes things are just meant to happen. Um, it's crazy. Uh, on May 16th, something as equally important happened. Slashaholics. On May 16th, 1994, over 30 years ago, Duke... The dumpster Drossy made his first ever WWF television appearance. So the premiere, the unveiling of Duke, the dumpster Drossy. And I always say Drowsy, which makes Josh upset because I don't know how to pronounce it correctly. Um, Duke, the dumpster has a very special place in my heart because one of my good friends growing up, his dad was a garbage man. So Duke, the dumpster was his favorite, his dad's favorite wrestler. So, I probably knew more about Duke the Dumpster than uh, most casual WWF fans. I wasn't a casual fan, but just most fans in general. Anytime Duke the wrestled, it was appointment viewing in the Richardson household. Um, yeah, so Duke was <laughs> Duke wasn't a main eventer. Duke, I don't even think Duke was main mid card. I would say he was like a glorified jobber, and I don't think you could. I think he did the best he could with that gimmick. I mean, he's fucking carrying trash cans to the ring. He's wearing overalls, and he's got like a uh, a waist belt that like helps him pick up heavier garbage cans. Um, he did the best he could with the gimmick that he was saddled with. Um, just too bad that we couldn't have seen what the Duke could have done with a different gimmick. Cause I don't think he ever really got a chance to, uh, to do anything else. And that was when the WWF was really down. I mean like 1995 WWF, they were pulling the water coolers out of Titan tower. They were taking uh, staples out of the staplers in the offices at Titan towers. Like, there were no paralegals being paid any settlements at this point. Uh, Vince McMahon was minding his P's and Q's. Uh, Duke the Dumpster, uh, yeah, not a lot of opportunity around WWF that time. So, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, happy anniversary to the Duke. What are your guys thought of, of Duke the Dumpster? Did you like him as a mid-card talent or like a, like a jobber to the stars, kind of like a Brooklyn Brawler talent? What are your memories of Duke the Dumpster? Leave them in the comments below. Um... Final wrestling story of the Express episode. So this is kind of like a, double, a two-parter. This is all about Ric Flair. So Ric Flair recently revealed, Slashaholics, that he had a heart attack that he didn't even know of. And it was pretty much revealed to him that he had a heart attack during his last match. The, the big pay-per-view that we covered. Uh, Ric, Ric Flair had a, a last match that was promoted by Jim Crockett. Uh, and it was kind of a big event, and it was like a three-way or six-man tag team match. But Ric Flair looked like absolute shit in that match. He looked mid-70s. He, he couldn't breathe. He couldn't do any of his old moves. It, he, was wearing a full, <laughs> he was wearing a full T-shirt, purple T-shirt. It was ridiculous. Um, he passed out like three times in that match, and he thought it was because he was dehydrated because he was like not drinking water, and he was drinking beer in the locker room and stuff. Um Turns out his doctor revealed to him after going through extensive tests that he had a heart attack during the match. And that's what caused the, him passing out. So he actually had a heart attack. So, I mean, Josh LaRue himself, my best friend and my, you know, co-star over here, who's on assignment in the Alaskan wilderness. He always says that, jo or that Flair wants to die in the ring. 
We came real close to actually dying in the ring. Um, it's really scary. Um, so that just, for me, it's like you can never let Ric Flair ever go in the ring again in any kind of capacity. He can never take a bump again. He's got a heart attack like three times. He had like a mass. He's missing like a major part of his heart, like a little p- a pie piece uh, revealed on these scans. It's black and it's dead. So he doesn't even have his full use of his heart. That's done. It's a wrap. You are a manager from now on. And I'm not even sure you can do that, Slash Alex, because uh, the other story is Ric Flair recently was kicked out of a pizza place in Florida uh, called Paisano's. He got into an argument with one of the managers at their pizza restaurant because they were apparently taking too long in the bathroom. Um, and Ric Flair made a stink about it uh, while the guy was in the bathroom making a stink of his, of his own. And uh, apparently Ric Flair needed in to use the bathroom. I don't know what the exact details of it were, but the bar eventually cut Ric Flair off because of this. Uh, he was causing a scene. Well, this was like one of Ric Flair's family members' uh, graduation parties or something from college. So they were down by like University of Florida or Florida State or something, but it was kind of a big deal. It was a family thing. And here's Ric Flair claiming to have spent $1,500 at Paisano's and, uh, He gets cut off in the middle of the afternoon and prepares to cut a promo on the bar manager at Paisano's. And uh, there's actually a clip uh, online. There's a YouTube video. You can find it really easily. Just say Ric Flair kicked out of pizza place. Look it up and see the interaction. Ric Flair is offering the waitress $1,000 to call this manager a dickhead. Uh, He's offering, uh, like, one guy at the counter wants to fight Ric Flair because he's like, I don't work here. I don't give a shit. Like, I'll fight you right now. Let's go outside in the parking lot. And the video kind of cuts after that, but apparently Ric Flair issued an apology, said that he was out of line, he shouldn't have reacted like that, but it just seems to me, Slashaholics, that Ric Flair is constantly, when he's in a situation where he's not revered or the center of attention in a positive way, he reacts like a child. And it seems like he always takes the low road, he never takes the high road. Um... Part of his whole shtick is that he's the nature boy and he's wheeling and dealing and kiss, kiss stealing and all this stuff he does. But at a certain point, the act gets old. And I just wish he'd be a little more gracious and a little bit more of a human being in these interactions. I don't know if he's getting scared that, like, if he's scared that he's getting close to death or something because of his health and his age and stuff. Maybe he just doesn't care anymore. I don't know what's going on. What do you guys think? What do the Slashaholics think? Why is Ric Flair acting a fool, basically, in every situation he's in? I mean, he's had multiple podcasts. He's had one with Conrad. He's had one with a good friend of his. And they they tend to always end with Flair uh, walking out or quitting or stating something happened between the two. But it's always somebody else's fault. Um, It seems like he never takes any accountability for his own actions. Uh, Just you hate to see it because Ric Flair has such a great history in the business of wrestling. And you want to see you want to see your heroes kind of act differently or behave differently. And I don't know. He just, he just loves his kamikazes. I don't know what to tell you. Um, yeah. So anyway, let's, let's leave the Ric Flair in the dust and let's get to slash track spooky and whore news. All right. First of all, happy birthday to Feruza bulk. She's 50 years old and she was the star of the craft. She was in the water boy and she was in one of my favorite movies of all time. Uh, return to Oz. And I am like one of the few people in the world that you would ask, what's your favorite Wizard of Oz movie? And I would say Return to Oz. Um, it's the first Oz movie I ever saw. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's the first one I ever saw as a kid. My first time ever being uh, introduced to the term TikTok. So TikTok was definitely not this uh, social media app. It was a the Royal Army of Oz. And TikTok was a badass. You just had to make sure he was wound up get his thinking all wound up, make sure his movement's wound up because he can kick some ass. All he needs is a lunch pail uh, from the lunch pail tree. He can whip some wheelers' asses. Return to Oz is probably... It's, it's considered a kid's movie, but I would... It's, if you go back and watch it, it's like a horror movie. It's like a spooky movie. Disney released this thing in the mid-'80s, and it was a, a colossal bomb, um, but it's now a cult classic. And if you would have asked, like, six-year-old Alex if it was a bomb, I would have laughed in your face. I love that movie. Uh, I still love that movie. I got lucky, and I found a copy of it at FYE years ago. 
and I never found another one. What I really want, though, is a VHS copy, but those are really expensive. Um, what are your guys' thoughts of Return to Oz? Uh, horror movie? Kids movie? Good movie? Do you enjoy it? But uh, anyway, happy birthday to Fruza Balk. She knocked it out of the park in basically any movie she was in. Uh, she's a great actress. Uh, I would love to see her do more stuff. Um, she hasn't really been in a lot of stuff lately, but always, always really enjoyed Feruza Balk, and I still do. So happy birthday. Um, on May 2nd, 1987, over 37 years ago, Creepshow 2 was released in theaters. Now, Creepshow 2 is a lot like Return to Oz for me. It's one of the first movies I remember watching um, as a kid with my dad and my brother and maybe even my mom. We used to rent horror movies every once in a while. Like when my mom wasn't going through like a religious phase or something where she was like, everything's the devil. Like the mom in The Waterboy. Um, she, we would rent horror movies every once in a while. And I remember Creepshow 2 being one of those movies that we'd like go to the video store and it was like five movies, five dollars, five days. And that was always one of the ones I'd rotate in. Um, I absolutely love Old Chief Woodenhead. I love that opening uh, scene, the opening segment. There's like three parts to that film. I love that one. I love The Raft. And I even like The Hitchhiker one. But The Raft stands out to me because um, we used to go fishing all the time. I, I grew up in like a small coastal town in Oregon. So we went to a lot of lakes and we went to the ocean and stuff. And I would you'd always see those rafts out in the middle of lakes. And I would have, my mind would go to like, what would I do? I was stuck on a raft and there was a lake monster that was wanted to eat my ass. Um, such a great movie, super underrated. Uh, not really as revered as the first creep show. And, and I enjoy the first creep show. It's really well done, but for my money, creep show two is where it's at. And I believe right now it's free on Tubi. I think you can watch it for free on Tubi. I think you can also watch it on YouTube as well. But check out those apps uh, if you guys don't want to spend any money. And you can have a good time watching it today. So check it out. Creepshow 2. Um, big ups to everybody that made that film. I love that. Made my childhood so much better. Uh, last horror story of the Express episode. Heather Langenkamp is officially down for another Nightmare on Elm Street comeback. So she's not signed or anything. But she's, uh, she has said, I am down to do this. And this is her quote. God, yes. I mean, of course. She's a great character. And she's referring to Nancy, Nancy Thompson. How could you say no? I just need somebody to get that off the ground, especially considering Nightmare on Elm Street Part 7, you know, Wes Craven's new nightmare. I do think there's a lot of really great opportunities for new and excellent battles still to come. So... You know, we've talked about this in the past. We've discussed it at length. Um... But she's officially saying, Slash Hawks, like she wants to do another Nightmare on Elm Street movie. And I'm all for it. Josh is all for it. Um, the Craven Estate is currently taking, you know, bids and, and pitches for new Nightmare content to be made. And I don't know um, what's the holdup. I, I mean, you're not making any money by just setting on this. Um, Robert England's not getting any younger. Uh, Heather Langenkamp's not getting any younger. Um I feel like it's a perfect opportunity to do either a direct sequel to the first 1984 classic Nightmare on Elm Street or to go the route of what they did with Halloween, what Bloomhouse did, and have Heather Langenkamp, you know, well, actually, it's the same idea, I guess. The, the sequel would be her preparing and having never let go of what happened from the first film. That you'd have an older Freddy, it would make sense. Or you could somehow maybe have it be a sequel to the original six. And uh, Nancy Thompson, something triggers Freddy back in her life. Maybe he's haunting her grandchild or something. And she has to uh, fight Freddy one last time. I mean, I have no idea. The, the, it's literally limitless. Um, you can come up with any idea you want. Uh, and I would go watch it. And also, it could be a good opportunity to pass the baton. after. I mean, Robert England states his last film. He, like, somehow Freddy's entity or his, or his essence could be passed on to someone else. And they could take on you know, introduce a new evil character and they could take on uh, the Freddy Krueger powers. And then you could continue the original six movies that way. There's a lot of different things you can do. Just don't discount what came before um, and you'll be all right. Never discredit what happened before. Fans hate that shit. If you, if nothing matters, 
like if if part you know parts two through six don't matter or if none of the movies that matter before uh then nothing matters right it's like why why care it's like it's just all made up whatever um i think a lot of fans had a big issue with freddy's revenge not being represented more represented more uh in the later films like or f or if at all because there's no closure to what happened to jesse it's like what the hell happened to him why didn't they bring him to weston hills they could have easily said he was the one who cut his eyelids off or he could have been with the group since he was one of the Elm Street, not one of the original Elm Street kids, but he sure as hell dealt with Freddie a lot in Elm Street uh, in the house of all houses. But fans don't like it when you just dis, uh, discredit or discount what happened before it. Keep it true to the, to the core stuff of what happened before and you will have success. Fans want to see this. This is like, it's going to make a hundred million dollars. Just make the damn thing. And then if you want to do something else, do something else. But the longer you wait, the less chance you're going to have to make it. Uh, all right, moving on. Who would win? So we got <laughs> Nicole Webb, who plays mother evil, uh, wrote into the show on slash tracks news, episode number 33 down in the comments. And she asks us who would win Steve Urkel or country buffet guy. This is a hell of a fight. Um, if it's just plain Steve Urkel and it's not the Bruce Lee Steve Urkel, Country Buffet win- Country Buffet guy wins all day long and twice on Sunday because he's going to carve Steve's ass up, okay? The problem is if Steve knows the fight's coming and is, has time to turn into Bruce Lee, Country Buffet guy is fucked. It is over, son. If he gets some woo juice, it is over, okay? It, it is a wrap. So, I don't know. If Urkel has time to, like, get the juice in his system and and it's morphing time for Urkel, I think Country Buffet Guy goes down. But if it's a straight-up head-to-head match, because Country Buffet Guy has got a lot of pent-up anger and frustration from just being at the buffet all day long. He's under those artificial lights. He's fucking hot because he's in that monkey suit. He's wearing, like, a little tie. He has to clean up his station all the time. He's constantly working. He's agitated. He's asking kids if they like ice cream sundaes. Uh, He's he's got a lot of pent-up anger and frustration. And I just think if it was a straight-up battle, especially if the country buffet guy had been carving or sharpening his knives at any point during the day, Urkel's dead. Now, if Steve gets some woo juice, totally different situation. What do you guys What do you guys think? Who who wins that battle, country buffet guy? Or Steven Urkel. Leave the comments below. And also, if you guys want to leave a, if you guys want to be featured in an uh, upcoming episode of Slash Tracks News or Slash Tracks News Express, uh, give us an option. Who do you give us a question? Who would win? Come up with your own. Send it to us uh, at Slash Tracks 2020 gmail.com. Send us Would You Rather's Dear Slashies. Ask for advice. Uh, if you want to sponsor a f- upcoming episode or anything like that, just like the Corys did. And they got a hold of us through the email, and they are they sponsored today's episode. So check it out. Hit us up at the email. Let's get into headlines to end the show. All right. I saw this one, and I immediately felt bad for the teacher, but I felt bad for the students, too. Sick teacher finishes his students' grades in hospital the day before passing away. So this teacher, uh, in 2020, the teacher was very ill. So I don't know that he knew he was like gravely ill, but he was sick. Uh, He goes to the hospital. He brings his laptop and his laptop charger. He's going to still grade his his papers. This is according to his son. Uh, They bring him to the hospital. There's actually a photo of him grading papers. He's in the bed with the laptop on his stomach. He's grading papers. This is the day before he dies. Now, if I'm a student and I got a failing grade from this guy and it was the day before he died, I don't know if I would be honored or if I would be pissed off. Um, I guess I've never seen more dedication to a job in my entire life. It's like this little bastard didn't get the answers correct and I'm going to fail him. I don't care if I die the next day or not. I'm going to make sure this kid knows he fucking failed. Um, Can you imagine being the kid that like failed that exam or whatever and like say it's getting close to the... (laughs) to the report card time and just if the teacher had died maybe the day prior you didn't fail that you know exam or whatever and you might have had a chance to pass the class because maybe you get like a you know like oh you know your teacher passed away sort of deal where you know everybody passes or whatever i don't know i don't know how it works when a teacher passes away i don't know if the sub grades it whatever 
But this teacher's so fucking dedicated to his job that he's grading papers while he's dying. I don't think I've ever been that dedicated to anything in my entire life. Um, I slash tracks hero of the day, I guess. Teacher that dies while grading papers the day before his actual, who's still grading papers till his death. Must have really loved his job. Um, or maybe he just had no sick time available. Maybe the school system has gotten so bad that there's actual zero sick time. He couldn't even call in sick. He still had to work while he's on his deathbed. Whew. Breaking news. Next story. Breaking news. In 2005, a South African man, Marius Ells, adopted a baby hippo after rescuing it from a river. Six years later, after years of companionship and bonding between the two, the hippo dragged Mar Marius into the same river that uh, he saved him from and ate him. So this guy saves this hippo six years ago, or whatever, six years ago from 2005. Raises this baby hippo as his own. They're friends. It's like a dog or a cat, albeit it's a hippo. And the hippo ends up dragging him into the same river six years later and eating him in the river. Um, that proves our point, uh, Slashaholics, that hippos are not man's best friend. I mean, obviously, uh, this guy got this guy should have got a fucking dog or a fish or something. Um, I don't even. Was he not feeding the hippo? What what was going on that made? What would make the hippo drag him to the exact river uh, that he was saved from? I guess the only thing I can think of is that he they lived by the river. So maybe they actually live like I don't know who knows. But that is a crazy story. It's actually a really horrible story. Um, bad, 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 bad deal. Should have had a Barks uh, or should have had a V8 that day. Crazy. Let me look over my rundown real quick, see what else I've got. If I got anything, what do I got? Nothing. You know what I do have? Last story of the Express. Choo choo, baby. Here we, here we go. This is my favorite story of the episode. Luxury brand Jordan Luca has created a pair of jeans called the Stained Stonewash Jeans that feature a prominent dark stain uh, right across the front of the jeans, okay? So, like, in the crotch area. The jeans quickly sold out even after, uh, or even, even though they had a hefty price tag. <laughs> so this tells me one thing, Slashaholics. You're not cool unless you pee your pants. Uh, and if peeing your pants is cool... Consider me Miles Davis. Uh, this is ridiculous because he could have, you know, these people that bought these pants for all this money, they could have just made these pants at home. They could have just pissed their pants. And these pants also look like the pants that came out in the 80s, like acid wash, stone wash things that like they're available at every Goodwill or St. Vincent de Paul's throughout the continental United States. They could just buy a pair of these pants for like six bucks and then piss their pants. This is a huge missed opportunity for a DIY situation at home. You are stupid for buying these pee pants. You could have just made them yourself. And that is the end of Slash Tracks Express, episode number three. Thanks, thanks everybody, for sticking with me. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Make sure you email us at slashtracks2020gmail.com. Hit up the Patreon. Hit up the Cameo. And make sure you subscribe to the new channel, Slash Tracks Network, with Alex Vanover. A lot of new content coming out. Uh, the, all, the, all the Express episodes going forward are going to be on that channel. Um, we're going to have wrestling reviews. We're going to have non-horror movie reviews. Non-horror acting. Uh, celebrity interviews. We're going to have just a, a, a bunch of fun stuff. So I want you guys to check that out. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out on any of it. And uh, I want you guys to all have a, a good night and a pleasant tomorrow. And mahalo, dogs. You got me mad now.